Okay. Um, let me welcome our presenter for this JALT International 2020 conference. Uh, our presenter is Jay Tanaka, and uh, please take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Um, so uh, my name is Jay Tanaka. Uh, I'll be doing the session today on demystifying and teaching critical thinking. Uh, I'm a specially appointed associate professor at Hokkaido University. This is a picture of our campus I took uh, a couple weeks ago. Uh, so if you're here and you, you read the, the blurb, you are probably interested in either the definition of critical thinking or teaching it or looking at how to, uh, how to evaluate student work in terms of critical thinking. So that's what the goals of the session are, luckily. And I'll be just going over one example uh, that I've done recently for teaching critical thinking and also just one example of student work. Hopefully there's enough time. Um, but first, the definition of critical thinking. So what is it? So decades of research on critical thinking shows that shows one thing and that is that no one agrees what it is really uh, everyone has a general sense of what it is maybe and uh, but definitely there is a great a variety of perspectives on it now let's just go through a few john mcpeck uh, critical thinking is relative skepticism robert ennis critical thinking is reasonable reflective thinking that is focused on deciding what to believe or do very different, Sarah Benish. A dem critical thinking is a democratic learning process, examining power relations and social inequities. So you can see just from those three examples, there's a variety of ways of uh, conceptualizing critical thinking. Everyone has, in the past, the researchers have tried to put it in a nutshell, tried to box it in, but it's a huge, complicated concept, and everyone has different. Uh, um, focuses on it, right? Even in this conference, there's a presentation tomorrow uh, by Travis West and Samuel Vincent Reed. Uh, they have it up on video, so I was able to go through it uh, ahead of time. But their definition is uh, critical thinking is focused on the difference between objective argumentation and subjective argumentation. So as an example, uh, they, their concept and uh, Benish's concept don't mix very well at all, right? But um, that's OK. Another way of looking at critical thinking is uh, taking themes. You can take the most, uh, not the most, but commonly found themes throughout different varieties of definitions, right? So you look at this list and these lists and you're thinking, well, okay, this gives that, that picture, that general sense of what uh, most people think critical thinking is. That's one way of thinking about it. Um, also, you can think about personal tendencies that people have, right? And that, that is included within the definition of critical thinking. You also have to be, uh, have such tendencies. In this case, these are called the, the habits of the mind. So it's a huge concept and it's very complex, but um, this, is, this session is for teaching. So uh, my suggestion is that in the classroom, we don't need to be concerned about accurately and comprehensively boxing in the concept of critical thinking. Uh, for teachers, critical thinking should be defined specifically according to that teacher's uh, context, right? What are the learning outcomes? What do you want the students to come out with? What kind of assignments are you, do you have to do in the class or are you planning to do? And those help to shape your context specific definition of critical thinking and that's fine. Uh, I don't think there are any uh, teaching contexts that I know of where students want to know the comprehensive uh, accurate definition of critical thinking anyway. But there's so much variety. Um, for example, the, the previous example, Benesh would, would teach a critical pedagogy class probably looking at uh, social justice uh, another teacher might focus on Bloom's taxonomy, also teaching critical thinking in a different way. Um, another teacher might use literature and say, you know, critical thinking focused on uncovering layers of meaning in literature. So there's so much variety. So it's up to each teacher to decide what needs to be in the definition for this class and what doesn't need to be in. Okay, 
So that's the first message. So let's take a little break from that and talk about it. So anyone have any, uh, can share in a sentence or two answers to these questions? What is your particular uh, focus in your class for critical thinking? Anyone want to share just a sentence or two? Uh, maybe I can, I'm Steve. Hi, Steve. Can you hear me? Yeah, I mean, in my classes with, with my students who tend to be at kind of pre-intermediate level English discussion classes, et cetera, I think with critical thinking, what I'm, what I'm trying to do kind of in a, in a gentle way is to get them to express opinions, support opinions, be able to reasonably agree and disagree with other people's opinions, to, and to be able to separate or analyze or differentiate what is a fact, what is an opinion. Um, and you know, basically those kinds of things, getting them to compare and contrast, sort of that's my kind of gentle notion of <laughs> what critical thinking is in my classes. Wonderful, thank you for sharing. Yeah, that's, uh, that's definitely uh, a, a one distinct way of teaching critical thinking. Actually, uh, I think a lot of people teach in similar ways, right? But again, it's different from using literature and different from social justice focused courses. So in this case, your, your definition, um, you could take ownership of the definition of critical thinking and say in this class, it's gonna be defined around separating fact from opinion, um, negotiating uh, of different opinions with other people. So in that class, that's what critical thinking right, is. Right? Right. And that's fine, yeah, thank you. Okay, so uh, just in the interest of time, we're gonna move on. Um, I would also like to add, besides the context specific definition that teachers should have, because it's a definition for the classroom, definitions for critical thinking should be easy to understand and easy to remember. So there's a the concept of sound bites that we see in science, right? So complex uh, scientific theory, it's too, it's too big to be uh, useful in a, lot of, in a lot of situations. So you have to boil it down, get it simple and package it so that students can understand and remember easily, right? And then also it has to have a clear application in the coursework. So your definition of critical thinking the students should be, uh, have no problem connecting that definition towards the things they're doing in class. And so those are things above uh, requirements that I think are, are, are good for teaching critical thinking. Okay, so that's very abstract. So let's get down to a detailed example. So what does it look like if you actually do this? All right, my, uh, out of the wide variety of possibilities for teaching critical thinking. This is just one way of doing it and uh, a way that I've done recently. So I just wanna give that as a disclaimer. So my way of critical thinking instruction is based off of Richard Paul's idea of strong sense critical thinking and the things he's focused on and I'm focused on these issues here. Uh, Self-deception, people are very uh, apt to consider themselves rational and other people irrational. So it's a, a problem there and contextual considera consideration logic. So one logic versus many logics and that's needed for these multi-categorical ethical issues. Right? So these are the concerns that I have and that lead to my definition. Multi-logical thinking, a little bit of closer look. So what is that? So deductive reasoning, um, supporting your arguments with facts, right? This is, this is, these things are part of deductive reasoning and that's needed. But in my view, critical thinking is more than that. That's wholly encompassed within it, but critical thinking requires you to go beyond one logic and explore many logics. All right, but that's, that's way too complicated for students in classes that I've taught. So I don't tell students that, but that's where I'm coming from. This is what I, I do tell students. My definition for critical thinking is uh, the exploration of possibilities and perspectives. So keeping it simple and hopefully memorable. And I focused on this concept of exploration. 
and that's in line with uh, the, the ideas I just shared, where I'm coming from. Yeah. Okay, but that's the definition where I'm starting from. The course looks something like this. I explain the critical thinking framework. Students select the topic, which is a controversial issue, because again, I'm interested in the, the multi-categorical ethical issues and the exploration concept. So they select the topic and then throughout the semester or the term, they go through the three steps of critical thinking, which I will go through later. Again, limiting it to three steps to make it memorable, but we'll talk about that in a little bit. And then they'll produce a final paper or presentation uh, on the topic to finish up. So the critical thinking framework is based on the definition I just gave. And I really focus on this point of exploration. And I say uh, to the students in our class, we're focusing on this goal, we want a deeper and more sophisticated understanding of the issue. That's our goal. And uh, on the opposite side, it is not our goal to come up with the correct answer. It is not our goal to come up with the best way or the right way. Uh, I explain to students that this is this is this kind of uh, these kind of goals are important in many situations, but they also uh, many times cause people to stop thinking and to close doors where. Uh, my focus is opening doors and exploration. So uh, I'm very specific in saying that just for this class only, this is our goal and we negotiate and all agree upon it. Okay. The three steps of critical thinking I mentioned are here. So students have to consider multiple perspectives and different logics. I explain this as uh, different opinions and different reasons. Uh, they have to support their own ideas, problematize them and talk about the contradictions and complications within the issue. All right, so for this first one, an assignment could be going on the internet, gathering comments, different kinds of comments, the comment section of YouTube videos, blogs. Uh, this could be reflection paper, reflection paper. It's pretty flexible uh, with what the students can produce. But this first step, uh, collecting opinions, uh, perspectives. So on the example of the topic in favor of hosting the Olympics or not, uh, collected, these are taken from a textbook, uh, pros and cons, and I adapted them a little bit. But the students will go through a variety of different perspectives, comments, and they will try to discuss what, what are the motivations behind these, these comments? Who are these people? Uh, what is their priority? We can see that these two people are in favor, but they have different Motive, different motivations for uh, why they give these comments, right? And the same is for these people as well, or against. So although they're both against, you can see uh, they have different motivations, they have different priorities that drive uh, what kind of comments they're giving. And so the students discuss what is the priority of Kaho, what is Taka's priority? So uh, running out of time, so I'm going to, I was originally going to do a discussion here, but we'll just skip that. Here is the, uh, here are the three steps again. So uh, that was basically uh, a quick run through of what step one would be. And step two is more uh, self-reflection, talk, practicing, talking about your, your own opinion, but also problematizing it, keeping that balance there, uh, balancing your own bias, things like that. And number three is, has to do with the uh, not rejection, but the accepting of contradiction uh, as part of uh, the discovery within the issue, right? So talking about uh, contradictions as okay and looking at them and learning from them rather than just outright rejecting them and not learning anything further. So the question I, I ask students is, uh, what, why is your topic so complicated? And the answer that they give is part of this step. Okay, the last thing was looking at student work. How do you evaluate critical thinking in student work? So it has to be tied, as I said, to your framework that you explained to the students in the beginning. So our context specific definition in the example was a focus on exploration and a focus on those three steps of critical thinking that were outlined. So the rubric that I use for grading papers or grading presentations have to, has to be strongly connected to these things, which is only fair. Uh, another thing is uh, text analysis. So looking at text uh, a little more closely, 
this is an example of a first draft of students uh, reflection writing on should we ban smoking? <clears throat> Excuse me. So how would you grade this student in terms of their critical thinking? So not the language, but you have to give them a, uh, a grade of their critical thinking, the, evaluate the quality of their critical thinking. So this is uh, a tough question in my opinion, and I'm currently working on research on this right now. So I welcome any ideas, but uh, some simple ideas you can take are uh, based on, again, the framework that I gave. Uh, you could count the number of distinct perspectives represented in the, in the text, right? Because I gave it explicit focus on exploring many perspectives. So therefore more perspectives should be better than less perspectives. I could make a rubric on balance, the, the amount of balance they have. If they're heavily weighted, if they're camping on one side of the issue, then I can fault them for that because we explicitly said uh, we're, our goal is to explore and to remain um, not camped on one side and to explore different uh, perspectives around the issue. So those ways I can have uh, reasoned ways of evaluating the critical thinking. Uh, I think it's a tricky subject, a very sensitive subject to evaluate another person's thinking, the quality of their thinking. So uh, definitely have a defensible framework for that. Um, last idea, a uh, little more detail going into the text. Highland went, uh, did some research on the elements of stance. So hedges, boosters, attitude markers, and self-mention. So this can help uh, people uh, evaluating writing, grading pieces of writing, uh, helping for students, peer feedback, et cetera. But basically it allows you to find markers in the text and zoom in on those spots. And more often than not, they will lead to discoveries of areas of critical thinking or non-critical thinking, maybe reductive thinking as an opposite. Uh, maybe hedges, hedges is the, is the clearest one. So when you have words like possibly, might, and perhaps, they're ge generally a clue that you're opening up discursive spaces, right? You're acknowledging complications, uncertainties. So it can be a hint um, at evidence of critical thinking in, in written work. So within the specific definition I gave for critical thinking, hedges may be useful for evaluating uh, student work, perhaps. Okay, so here's some selected references and we have uh, five minutes, a little more for questions, if anyone has. Okay, thank you very much. Um, yeah, if you want to add your questions to the chat or just open up your mics. Oh, here we go, let me see the chat here. All right, uh, thanks Jay for the presentation. I was just uh, wondering about um, the um, critical thinking uh, framework in terms of, uh, as you mentioned, grading students' quality of thinking. Mm -hmm. uh, and you kind of sort of look at um, Highland's uh, um, template of sorts uh, yes. and apply that to assessing writing. I think Highland did uh, some work on writing, specifically genre writings, uh, on, with regards to stance, yes. Uh, I was wondering, um, here we're looking at assessing the product, right? Uh, yeah. Of that um, process of critical thinking. Mm -hmm. When we talk about critical thinking, there's two elements here. One is we, we wanna see evidence of that. Uh, so the easiest way is through product, right? Uh, assessing and, and then coming up with a rubric and, and, and a defensible framework. And yes. the, the other bit that I'm interested in actually is the process of it. How do we sustain metacognitive engagement <laughs> while students are uh, engaging in criticality? How do know? we sustain it? Um... How do we sustain it? Because um, one of the things that you mentioned was about you know controversial issues. That's one way, right? Uh, to activate that effective domain, because if mm -hmm. if there's no emotional connection in the process, mm -hmm. then there will be you know metacognitive breakdown. Criticality cannot sustain itself, and then you get students into this uh, whirlpool of frustration. You know, it's too difficult. Mm -hmm. It's too abstract. You know, so 
there must be some kind of uh, scaffolding or layering that takes place before um, the actual work is is done. That's just my thought of it. Yeah, yeah. Well, there. Hmm, that's a very, very good question, and it's of course a complicated issue. So, well, first of all, my belief is that uh, critical thinking is a tool. So I'm very careful to avoid the notion that critical thinking is a, a way of life, a way of being, and I, I, I tend to. It's my personal bias to stay away from that. Um, that level of indoctrination. Uh, so I generally see critical thinking as a tool that is free for students to take ownership of if they want or if they don't want, it's their choice, right? So, um, but if you're interested in, in keeping their motivation up and in inspiring them to continue using it, then uh, it's, it's a matter, as you said, of motivation. One thing that I will add though, um, Bell Hooks said that uh, identified critical thinking as something that is time consuming, difficult and uncomfortable. And I really agree with this, right? So we have to be clear with the students. Critical thinking in the sense that I presented it anyway is very stressful sometimes and it's tiring and time consuming. So I agree with you, it can be a challenge to tell students to keep doing it throughout a long period of time. Uh, so I'm sorry, there's no clear answer for that, but yeah. Um, um, I, it's, it's, uh, just to jump in there, I, it's, um, there is one approach that's um, um, taking some uh, ground at the moment, uh, particularly in Australia and, uh, and in New Zealand, and that's the philosophy for children approach where it gets students to, to do the readings and then they discuss about the readings um, uh, based on a stimulus question. Right, that is provocative, uh, and and of course by provocative I mean controversial. Um, that, can def that can definitely work. Uh, let me get through some of the other questions. I'm seeing a bunch of you in the chat, um, just because I only have two more minutes left. Uh, so the first question I see: using information or generating information in ways. I, I don't understand. Ah, oh, I see. I see. I see. I don't understand the question for that. I think one, those so. were comments to your earlier. Uh, ah. asking for participation. I think the ah, last one I is see, a I question, see, see. actually. Wonderful. Oh, okay, good. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Show their view. Yeah, so yeah, uh, ways of helping them to show different ways of communicating their own uh, stance, right? Their own perspectives. Breaking down false dichotomy. Yeah, I think that's, uh, that. I personally uh, align with that. Uh, I think that uh, my concept of critical thinking is very connected to fallibility right? So everything is fallible. So we have to go around and investigate um, false dichotomies and question things. Uh, what do you think is the value of teaching CT in language classroom? Okay, so that's another complicated question. Academic skills is the clearest answer. So it generally in, in many, uh, I got to be careful here, in many regions, in many uh, domains of academia, critical thinking skills are uh, generally considered desirable. And so that's probably the clearest value of teaching CT. So students who are going on for academic work or to, who, who seek to pr produce high levels of academic work. Um, I, I published a study a few years ago uh, showing that students in a critical thinking class is uh, valued it in terms of their personal life as well. And there are some examples, uh, excerpts in the text there uh, it's in TESOL journal, um, Tanaka and Gilliland. So you can find comments on how they describe how critical thinking was not only useful in the classroom, but helped them. Um, I think it was one of the students with their roommate. There was a disagreement with the roommate. And then another student was uh, talking about his frustrations with tourists in Okinawa. And uh, yeah, so how he used it for, and he's from Okinawa. Yeah, so. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I'd like to ask everyone to unmute and let's uh, give Jay a round of applause. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sorry, I couldn't get to um, all of the questions very well, but thank you. Um, if I could, could you please put up those uh, the reference slide again? Uh, let's see. Um, yes, and, and if anyone would like to continue the conversation, um, you can go to the Hangouts room uh, for room nine. I'm, I, I guess it only works if more than one of you go. 
Um, also, please visit, visit the uh, educational materials exhibit and check out our, the JALT sponsors. Please support them because we really appreciate their support for helping us make this conference possible. Um, again, yeah, thank you so much for coming. Um, we need to uh, end the meeting in, in this presentation, get ready for the next one. Um, thank you so much. All right. Thank you very much.